Good morning, everyone. <laughs> I'm Margo Smith, Director of Kluge Roo Aboriginal Art Collection. And on behalf of the Kluge Roo Collection and our partners, the Institute for Global Humanities and Cultures, the Embassy of Australia, and the Vice Provost for the Arts, I welcome you to the Beyond Dreaming Symposium. Please join me in acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land we're on today, the Monacan people, and paying respects to their elders past, present, and future. This symposium celebrates three decades since the groundbreaking exhibition Dreaming's the Art of Aboriginal Australia at the Asia Society Galleries in New York. And that exhibition catapulted Indigenous Australian art onto the world stage. So we are reconsidering its historical moment and examining its legacies over these three days. Dreamings was the first major introduction to Aboriginal art for American audiences and represented a turning point in its international rec reception. Anthropologist Fred Myers describes it as the moment when Aboriginal art emphatically became fine art. Fred was supposed to be here to speak on this topic, but was unable to travel due to a family illness. We're sad that he can't be here, and we wish his family well. But also, as Peter Sutton pointed out last night, we would encourage anyone who wants to learn more about dreamings to read Fred's book, Painting Cultures, The Making of Aboriginal High Art, published by Duke University Press in 2002. This symposium grew out of the current exhibition at Kluge Roo, Beyond Dreamings, The Rise of Indigenous Australian Art in the United States, curated by nine graduate students in a course with Henry F. Skerritt. Henry began working at Kluge Roo in 2016 as the Curator for the Arts of Australia um, through a grant with the Mellon Foundation. Since then, he's involved classes of UVA students in the curation and research of Aboriginal art from our collection, um, students from UVA and students from other universities through the Summer Curatorial Research Project. So we're very proud of the work that he's done with students and the ability to showcase their, um, their research at Kluge Roo. So um, please help me welcome Henry F. Skerritt to the stage. Today is a day for forgetting things. And I was just like, oh no, oh, I've forgotten my notes. That would be terrible. Uh, let me begin by acknowledging the Monacan people. It was such a, a, an honor for us uh, to have Karen Wood um, make uh, such a brilliant effort to come uh, and open the symposium last night. Um, but I'd like to pay my respects to Karen and to all the uh, elders past and present of the Monacan people, uh, and just acknowledge that we are, we are gathered today on their land. Dreamings. As a curator of Aboriginal art in America, one of the hardest things you have to do, and I have to do it about four times a day, is explain the concept of dreaming to Americans. It's a tough one. And in part, it's tough because, as most of us know, it's not a single thing. It's an entire worldview. It's an organizing principle that structures every part of Aboriginal being. In choosing to title their exhibition Dreamings, Peter Sutton and his curatorial team, many of whom are here today from the South Australian Museum, announced the immensity of their ambitions. Dreamings would be an act of translation of the most radical kind. As part of the programming for the exhibition, the artists Billy Stockman Japuljari and Michael Nelson Jagamar created a sand painting in the auditorium at the Asia Society. During the performance, a befuddled New York viewer asked, oh, and here I get to do my New York accent. I'm going crazy here. <laughs> what am I viewing? Is this religion or art or a combination? I'm in shock here. Was that all right? Pretty good, pretty good. In considering the legacies of dreamings after three decades, the comments of this anonymous New Yorker seem particularly apt. When rereading the catalogue, which is extraordinary, 
reading the reviews, speaking to the curators and the key interlocutors, a clear picture emerges. Everyone involved in this exhibition knew they could feel they were at a historic moment. But talking to them this week, no one's given me an exactly clear answer why. For us here at Kluge-Roo, Dreamings holds an extremely important place in our institutional history. It was the exhibition that introduced Americans uh, to Aboriginal art, and in particular, John W. Kluge, who uh, was the founder of our collection. And for that reason alone, it would be entirely fitting for us to be celebrating 30 years since this historic exhibition. But if we're to live up to the ambitions of Peter Sutton and his collaborators, many of whom we're so lucky to have here, we must return to that initial moment. We must put on our New York dancing shoes and ask, what are we viewing? One of the reasons that explaining the concept of dreaming is so hard for non-Indigenous people to get their heads around is that it exists in a tense that's not found in the romantic languages. The ancestral events of the dreaming do not exist in the past, but in the was, is, and will be tense that Bill Stanner memorably defined with the neologism everywhere. And in considering the legacies of this exhibition, I wonder if we're not faced with a similar problem. The moment that dreamings occurred was a particularly undefined one. In 1988, the world stood on the precipice of global realignment. Within a year, the Berlin Wall would fall and the World Wide Web would be launched. In Australia, the bicentennial celebration, I was about to say celebration, but the commemoration of the bicentenary of British invasion was causing a profound reassessment uh, of Australian identity. But at the moment that Dreamings opened at the Asia Society, these events existed in a peculiarly did happen, are happening, will happen tense. Dreamings was clearly of its moment, but at the same time, it was a defining event in its own right. Many elements of the exhibition were radical, most notably its insistence on rejecting the false dichotomy of art and ethnography. And although curated by a team of non-Indigenous anthropologists, it set new benchmarks for community consultation and its catalogue remains a foundational reference in the field. Like any significant exhibition, Time has served to both clarify its curator's foresight while revealing those developments that they either could not or did not predict. And this in no way lessens the historical significance of dreamings. And in fact, I would argue is indicative of the complexity of the moment that it inhabited. The world was changing in ways that few could have imagined. And I think it's only just coming into focus that this moment signal not just the emergence of new discursive paradigm of contemporary art, but also in the new conditions of globalization. If this suggests that this moment was neither stable nor singular, it's perhaps because the very terms of this discourse were not only far from settled, but necessarily aporetic. If there's a defining feature of our contemporary epoch, it's our acute awareness that our world is composed of infinite an irreconcilable difference. The legacy of dreamings then might lie less in any of its inherent radicality or conservativeness than in its role in ushering in this new era. What am I viewing becomes a question whose relevance has only increased as contemporary art has become the paradigmatic art of our time. And as we reflect on the past three decades of Indigenous art, we might consider how Indigenous Australian artists themselves, like our very honoured guest, Balangjong Moanjil, uh, have themselves embraced this paradigm, how they've produced works that have expanded both the boundaries of Indigenous and global contemporary art. Three decades later, we stand again at a precipice. The rise of nationalism and extremism, both here and abroad, is threatening the once utopic possibilities of global connectivity. But at the same time, the imminence of environmental catastrophe makes the need for global <coughs> solutions dangerously urgent. Is it a coincidence that this moment here in the USA, art institutions across the country are again turning their focus to indigenous Australian art? 
Is our current moment one like that of 1988, the was, is, will be moment of tectonic global shifts? The past five years have certainly seen an explosion of interest in Aboriginal Latin America. Here at Kluge Roo, we find ourselves being both an outpost for Australia, an unlikely embassy for the greatest art movement on the planet, but also the centre of a global campaign, the home base for the latest Australian assault on the American art world. So it's our great privilege here today to hear from some of those pioneering artists and curators who laid the groundwork for this charge and who continue to define and redefine the field in which we work. And so today, we hope to approach these big questions with the ambition and open-endedness with which they were raised 30 years ago. We want to evaluate how dreamings has changed the discourse of contemporary art, but also to situate it within the larger global field of art, exhibitions, and society. And so it's my very great pleasure to introduce the speakers for our first panel. The panel is going to be moderated by John Carty, the head of humanities at the South Australian Museum, professor of anthropology at the University of Adelaide. And John will be moderating a discussion between three of the key members of the Dreamings team. Peter Sutton, curator and anthropologist, senior research fellow at the University of Adelaide, editor of the magnificent catalogue that accompanied Dreamings. Chris Anderson, principal at Yuri Global and senior advisor at Acorn International, who from 1993 to 1998 was the director of the South Australian Museum. And Francois Stoussart, professor in the Department of Anthropology and the Department of Women's, Gender and Sexuality Studies at the University of Connecticut, whose work with the Walpri women artists at Yundamu has been foundational in the field. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome these esteemed colleagues to the stage. Um, I'll begin by saying Nadlu Tambadi Nadlu Monakan Yatanga Tikanti. In the language of the Ghana people on whose land uh, my museum and, and the museum that we've all worked for uh, sits and in the spirit of its, um, of its work to tell the story of our country, um, we acknowledge also that we're on the, the land of the Monacan people here in, in sharing this story. And I, it's probably a major shift from 1988 to have Karen here last night, to have uh, the curators and, and directors of, of museums acknowledging um, the people of this country before we begin our talk. So I think that was a really nice, it, we all really appreciated that last night and it speaks to the spirit of the work that Dreamings was probably trying to achieve 30 years ago. It has made a dent in, in small ways and big ways. Um, also, excellent 10 minutes of power from Henry Skerritt there. That was like, <laughs> it's really hard to condense history and big ideas and politics into a pithy and slightly charismatic 10 minutes, and so... Just slightly, though. Slightly. I just, it's, it's worth pointing out. That's an art form, and I thought that was really great. Just, there's lots of love in the room today. I'm starting on that note. Um, I won't have a whole lot to say in, in the next hour, because I think it's, it's a, a real honour for me to be able to um, probe the, uh, my forebears at the South Australian Museum and, and explore the, the human scale of this story. It's easy to get lost in the abstractions and the arguments, but I think it's really important to bring back the details of how an exhibition is made and the people who made it. And, and from that, these bigger politics are actually more manifest and more real. Um, what I did want to say, though, was that and these three won't know it, but when I interviewed for the role that I currently now hold at the South Australian Museum, um, I basically gave a lecture to the staff about how important Dreamings was and that they'd all seemingly forgotten the incredible legacy of work that was going on at the South Australian Museum 
in the 1980s and, and 90s. And it was one of the pioneering museums probably in the world in terms of repatriation, in terms of um, pushing the dialogue out from ethnography and anthropology into uh, the politics of contemporary Aboriginal um, creation and practice. And um, it was a very brave and extraordinary institution. And, and we're recovering that history at the moment by thinking through what was going on with Dreamings. And so I basically lectured the museum staff on how important this exhibition was and, and why I wanted to take that moment from 1988 and the legacy of that and bring it into the present, bring it into how a museum reimagines itself in Australia in, in 30 years later. What's, what year is it? 2019. I'm a little bit jet lagged. Um, and so for me, this is a really important exhibition and it's really amazing to be talking to these three about it. It's, it's also, the conversation here is exploring the intellectual and political and cultural legacy of the show here in America. I think it's really important to understand that it had a huge, a huge impact in Australia as well. And, um, and that legacy is still being debated and it's still being realised. It is a work in progress, as Henry's kind of noted, and I think it's really important to work with these kinds of questions in that, in that light. Um, we're at the, you know, the South Australian Museum's collections were the, the, the basis of this exhibition. Um, they're some of the most extraordinary cultural collections on the planet for the story that they tell about Australia. And, and they're at the heart of debates in our country at the very moment, which most of you won't know about, creating the first um, national Aboriginal um, cultural institution um, in Adelaide. And that's going to provoke a series, another 30 years of debates probably, but it's interesting to see that the legacy of Dreamings 30 years on is now perhaps only finally starting to take shape in Australia as well. Um, and so in the light of that, I just wanted to frame this as not um, as an equally important conversation for those of us who are wrestling back in Australia. The work that happens here is in dialogue. You know, the Kluge Roo is a part of uh, the beating heart of this story in Australia as well. Um, and it's really important. Um, so I'll, that's the end of me. Um, and I'll move on now, I think, to um, the slides that, that Francoise and Peter and, and uh, Chris have prepared for us and digging into the history of how Dreamings was made and giving, painting that portrait before we start debating Dreamings. I think it's really important to get into that. Um, so Peter, I think, I guess the, the, the origin story of Dreamings, like w how did it come to be in four minutes or less, um, is probably the really interesting starting point for most people in this room. Like, at, like, had you spent 30 years mapping out dreamings and then finally were ready to unleash it on the world? Or was it a more serendipitous situation? No, it all rotates around cocktail parties in New York, really. And I'm not, not entirely joking. Um, the idea for the exhibition was put to the director of the Asia Society Galleries, Andrew Pekarik, by the Australian uh, Consul General in New York, John Taylor probably at a, at a Consul General cocktail party or one of the Asia Society's more swanky do's. Um, and Picaric became keen on the idea, but he then started looking for a curatorial team. And he, in his own words, and this is in his preface to the Dreamings catalogue, he says he was frustrated. He couldn't find anyone he thought was up to it until he went to an, yet another cocktail party, at, this, according to my sister who uh, sent me an email last week. Um, uh, she, she met him, she met Andrew Pekarik, this is Ruth Barrett who's also mentioned in the preface. She met Pekarik at, at this uh, event <clears throat> and he said to her, oh, you're from Australia. She was a member of the Asia Society herself. She lived in Manhattan. Um, and he said, I just can't find anyone. And she said, well, you should ring my brother. <laughs> now, he later told me, yeah, yeah, in New York, everyone's got a relative who can fix you up cheap, you know, for <laughs> best plumbing. Um, anyway, he rang, he got in touch, he flew out. He came to the Art and Land exhibition opening in 1986 at the South Australian Museum. 
an exhibition and catalogue. Uh, the catalogue's by Philip Jones and myself. It's called Art and Land. We were, we were already broaching, we were already trying to smash the breach between ethnography and the art world. Um, in that case, and it engendered a, a very uh, volcanic public debate between myself and um, uh, Professor Donald Brooke, a professor of fine arts, uh, an art theoretician, a theoretician of aesthetics, who said it wasn't art and you shouldn't use that word. So anyway, we had a big fight and I won. Uh, I think, I think <laughs> anyway, that's my view, anyway. Um, so, <clears throat> Uh, in that, during that visit, uh, he spoke to the higher ups, the director and the chairman of the board, and so on in Adelaide, and uh, agreed to they, they agreed to the idea. It took a long time to persuade my my director to actually do it. He said, well, "Why are we doing this for the Yanks?" You know, he was from Bordertown. You can imagine where Bordertown is. It's out in the middle of nowhere, and he was a bureaucrat from the education department. But he had trust in us, so that was that was crucial. And uh, the, the lead up to the exhibition was in t in terribly complex. I, we've kept every document, um, uh, by the way, in Adelaide. Uh, but uh, Pekarik then came back in 87 and we did what we called field consultations. We went to see the artists who we wished to have in the exhibition or their next of kin if they were deceased. And that's uh, this is the first place we went to was Arakoon in Cape York Peninsula, closer to Port Moresby than to Cairns. <clears throat> and uh, that's me with three of my brothers there. And from there we crossed over to Arnhem Land, we went to Yirkala, uh, um, Ramangini, Maningrida, Darwin, <clears throat> uh, the Tiwi Islands, that's uh, Kalawajpara, that's at Milikapiti in the Tiwi Islands. That's a, we were assisted by a local anthropologist who was very deeply enmeshed with the people and in fact married in. And next, maybe. Um, uh, and at Yundamu, we met up with Chris and Francoise. This was Francoise's deep and long field area. She spoke well, very fluently and knew everybody. And Chris had been working on repatriation of sacred objects with the senior men of this community for some time. <coughs> <coughs> so it, uh, in, in, in several cases, we were not consulting strangers. We were dealing with people with whom we were enmeshed in terms of adoptive kinship. The people at Arakoon all called me by kin terms because I was taken as a son by a senior man in 1976. This is the normal thing with anthropologists in such a society. <clears throat> there we are at Pirbir uh, Prakano, which became my Walbury name eventually, um, warming up in the, in the intense cold of the desert. Um, we, the list of communities we went to and the list of 89 named Aboriginal people with whom we discussed the exhibition are all in the catalogue. Uh, go to page 265. So I've done my homework here, you know. Um, and um, so the, a lot of the preparation involved, for example, long and detailed negotiations with the conservation laboratory next door to the museum, <clears throat> who did a brilliant job, including sending a courier with, with all the objects to every airport tarmac all the way across the Pacific uh, and to be present at the unpacking. There was, uh, Peter, are you going to cut me off? Well, I might get um, Francoise and Chris to, yeah. drum, to jump in here sure. and talk about um, their experience of those consultations and then we'll come back to the, the later processes because I think sure. it's a fairly extraordinary thing in 1988 for, um, I've been through Peter's extensive notes. I've got about 84 boxes of Dreaming's archives in my office that I was going through in recent weeks. It's incredibly well documented and to see... Uh, a team of museum staff to bringing Pekarik out to Australia and spending two months, like literally clearly in the same T-shirt from those photos that we just saw of Peter. Uh, I can't talk, by the way. I'm in the same T-shirt from about three days. Um, that's an extraordinary thing, the commitment to engagement with the artists and with the communities in 1988 was unprecedented in Australia. It's still unprecedented for most art galleries. And I think it's an extraordinary thing that, um, you know, it'd be nice to get Francoise and Chris to reflect on the politics and the ethics of that engagement as well. And you're, and also funny stories altogether. Okay. Uh, there you go. 
A um, couple of things that are interesting. I just want to reflect on what Peter said. Um, you know, I, I'm a pan-Pacific person, so I'm sure nobody can guess where I grew up, which is about 100 miles from here. And this is how we speak in West Virginia. <laughs> um, but, you know, having spent 30 years back and forth between the US and Australia, I, I think I have a perspective on Australia that is a view that, that this exhibition represents. For, for one thing, this wasn't done in an economic vacuum. We couldn't raise the money in Australia for this show. It, it was New York money that paid for it, which is a fascinating thing in itself. And then also, and I say this affectionately, Australians kind of genuflect, you know, certainly a little bit less now, but in those days, everything that was important was outside the country. And that's partly why Dreaming's had such an effect, not because it came from Australia, but because it went to the US and then came back to Australia. Um, so that's a point, you know, the money, the money side of it was very important. It was an expensive exercise, but we couldn't raise a dime in, in Australia for this. Um, and, and the other aspect I think is, is one that, and, and I probably shouldn't say this, but Peter and I talked about it last night, that we weren't museum people. We were there under false pretenses in that we were really social anthropologists. And for us, the collection was secondary to the people who uh, the things originated from, but also the, the living descendants of those people. And we saw our job as reconnecting the collection with the people from whom the things came. And so I think you'd only done one exhibition, and I don't think I'd done any. No, neither of us had set foot inside a museum except with our children. Um, <laughs> before getting, before getting, getting the job, I, I got my first job in that museum in 1984. We did Art and Land in 86, Dreamings in 88. And in 1990, I went back to being a land rights uh, anthropologist come hippie. But just one more thing, and then I'll turn it over to you, Nangala. Um, you know, I, I, this whole thing, and, and John Mundine spoke about this yesterday, the kind of opposition of uh, fine art and analysis of, of art versus the kind of so-called ethnographic perspective. And, and certainly in those days, we were seen as the poor cousins that, you know, we weren't really, we didn't really know about art, you know, but, you know, we did, uh, we sat and talked to people and collected things around culture and songs and things. But, but I think... In, in, in both, both perspectives are very important, and they cert both perspectives certainly informed this exhibition. But I think the primary thing was that we, we see people first and the objects second, as opposed to uh, some people in, in, in the fine arts side who, who really look at the object first and the people are secondary. I mean, I've, I've even had fine arts people say to me that they didn't think there should be any labels on paintings because you should just be able to understand and absorb the aesthetic of the painting without any kind of context. And so we were treading that line between these things of having wonderfully beautiful objects, but only because of the people who produced them and the culture that they came from. So I have a, a little bit a, a different take on both of them because at the time I was a graduate student and I was trying to smash the difference between art and anthropology because the people I was working with at the time um, wanted to sell paintings and wanted to raise money. And um, mostly there were you know, men and women who were doing this. So when um, Chris Anderson and Peter Sutton came to Yundumu in 1985, Christmas had arrived. I could absolutely use those guys to advance my mission. Right. Um, and then, <laughs> and I did, and I did, I did, I did, I did. Um, and then Chris and I did an exhibition in 1987, which is, um, which was just on Yundumu. So Dreaming's also created, you know, the possibility of Dreaming created this space for um, the painters at Yundumu to experience what it means to um, be involved in a show, but also going to, to the show and going to New York. Because until then, you know, they had to imagine their audience, they had to imagine their bias through me, um, rather than just being there. So that was an extraordinary moment for the artist um, 
and I think just for all the artists that you consulted with, that they were not consulted before. No. Right? I mean, that, that, that is so key about Dreamings, is that you bring the artist to not just be uh, consumed, but they become consumer of art as well. Yeah, and I, I suspect that is one of the un, unwritten legacies of Dreamings in a pretty major way Absolutely. for a lot of pretty senior and amazing artists who were involved in that process and went to New York as well, which made real the scale of that art movement, which uh, artists working in remote communities in Australia in 1980s probably did not know yet because there hadn't been an international audience for their work. Um, did you want to say something more can just I, on... Can I just add something? I yeah. think what's also crucial about Dreamings is that a lot of the artists who came or a lot of the artists who were consulted saw also what else was going to be exhibited, mm. okay? That, so that's also really rare. So you guys so were they showing... Had, so, they had a whole, so they had a whole idea of what they were going to find. Okay, so you weren't just showing people in Millicarpity the um, Millicarpity material. They would also know what was going on in Yundamu and I didn't, they, they at least get when a you sense guys arrived at Yundamu, you had other photographs. Well, you saw them on the fl on the ground in the background of one yeah. of those slides. And that mm. that slide where Andrew Picaric <clears throat> and Chris and I are sitting, they they were seeing everything that was going to be in back back back. I know. Mm. Back. People people generally knew. Yeah, this one. Yeah, oh, there you go. They're yeah. on the ground. <laughs> But people didn't always accept that they were the painters of the painting. <laughs> um, in one case at uh, Gunbalanya, I was showing a man p paintings, and I said, uh, there's that one, and there's that one, and we have to make a choice, you know. But he, he's, he, it was his work, according to all the documents. And he said, yeah, good painting. Who did them? <laughs> and I said, you did. And he said, OK. <laughs> this actually has a deep point because the designs are from the ancestors. Uh, the, the individual performance may differ every time slightly, but the imprint is from something beyond personality. And that's the point there. You go. Yeah, just um, in some ways, we've got a whole bunch of things here, but one of the most memorable things for me was, was being with the artists in New York City. And it really brought home the, one of the fundamental aspects of Aboriginal culture is interpret, interpreting the landscape. And people in the bush, people are constantly going through the landscape and seeing it with the, both a human lens and a religious lens. And um, I saw this big time in New York City. Um, I, I was with Michael Nelson Giacomaro, who was one of the main, his painting is on the catalog, in front of the catalog, and Bill Stockman Jappajari, uh, one of the old Papanya School uh, founders. And, and we went down, we were supposed to go downtown for a radio interview, and there was a gridlock in Manhattan. And so I said, oh, okay, let's get the subway. And so these two old men and me, just the three of us, we go down into the subway, and, and the men are petrified. And I'm sure some of you are petrified by the New York subway too. Um, but I, I knew it well. But we get down there and we're sitting down and they get closer and closer to me like this, both on, on both sides. And, and Michael said to me, and Michael speaks good English, he said, what is this place? And I said, oh, it's just a little train, you know? And, we, and as we're going along, we were on the, the, uh, the line that comes up sometimes and then goes down and comes up. And I, I explained that to him and he saw how went up and went down. He said, oh, just like the rainbow serpent. Mm -hmm. and, and it's very true. I mean, there's many stories all over Australia of, of, of the serpent going underground and coming up. And they were interpreting the subway in terms of their cultural lens. And then all of a sudden, I noticed a woman across the aisle from us, uh, a, a white woman, New Yorker. And she was looking at us in a way we would call hard. And you know, when a New Yorker looks at you hard in that sort of context, Something's going to happen. And I, I thought, I'm thinking, wait a minute. Headline, anthropologist dies defending Aboriginal artists. And all of a sudden, the woman stood up, and she came over and got right in front of Michael. And I thought, OK, here we go. I'm going to tackle her or punch her or something. But she got right in front of Michael and said, you're Michael Nelson Jacomar, aren't you? I saw your painting in the Asia Society. It's fantastic. And so you know, Jacomar's head's like this. <laughs> 
the many, many stories about the adventures we all had in New York City. Uh, um, some of the, is, is um, Nampi Jimp in that photo? No. Okay, one of the Aboriginal women, we're walking from uh, the west, uh, west side across Central Park to the Asia Society, and all of a sudden they see uh, squirrels. And the women just shot after the squirrels because, you know, that good meat too. Um, just the, the adventures we had. We walked past the Dakota building, um, and, and one of the women asked, why do you rub charcoal all over your buildings here? You know, because it was black, the whole building. <clears throat> Just amazing adventures uh, with, with those guys. But I think we have to be careful not to exoticize their experiences of the I'm painters. I'm exoticizing you my are, experience. But you are, you are a little bit. Because I think they were really interested in understanding how people understood them. Um, in being in New York, in being, you know, artists. So they were they they asked, they did ask some really interesting of, questions and engage yeah. you know the the New Yorkers. I think we'll we'll um we'll zip to that bit in yeah. in just a sec because I want to skip through some of Peter's mm -hmm. slides and bring us to that moment where there'll be some visuals as well. Sorry to sure. be abrupt, but that's actually my job. Um, what I, what I just wanted to flick through these Peter really briefly because. There, there was the community engagement in Australia, but there was also a political engagement with art galleries, with the establishment, with collectors, um, that fed into some of the gaps in the South Australian Museum's collection to ensure that America was getting uh, a more fulsome view. Can you just quickly speak to some of these slides that we're going to get through? Yes, that's Margaret Carnegie, um, a very rich woman whose entire apartment was full of Aboriginal art. And uh, <clears throat> I had known her before, but we took a, our photographer with us, uh, Michal Kluvanek, a brilliant photographer who did all of the imagery for Art and Land in 86 and all of the Australian imagery for the uh, Dreamings book. And, uh, he, well, it, it's a very long relationship to have with a single photographer. <clears throat> but uh, here's the, um, the other end of the um, material culture spectrum of, of uh, collectors. <clears throat> uh, this is Vivian Johnson, famous for her works <clears throat> in the Western Desert. Uh, Tim, whose father worked, was my sister's boss uh, back in the 60s. Um, there's a, so a work of art and another work of art. The, the one in front is Dadaist. Um, it's cig cigarette butts and an empty beer can. Um, anyway, and the other one behind looks like Dingari or something like that. But anyway, go on. Well, one of my questions, just talking with you b before this, um, I think it's interesting that there was some annoyance with the art establishment in Australia that um, anthropologists and a museum were involved in telling this story. Was there not? Yeah, I can... Uh, well, basically, the, the, the higher-ups in the fine art world said, oh, no, museum, anthropology, that's dead stuff. Like, you know, that's not it. And so I, I actually, we, we, we uh, schmoozed uh, these people. We went to see Bernice Murphy at the Power Institute, and, and we went to see Edmund Capon at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. Edmund took one look at me, gave me a glass of scotch, and basically ordered me to go and sit in a corner while, while he dealt with the big man from New York. And um, so I felt like the, prover the proverbial in the punch bowl. <clears throat> Bernice Murphy looked slightly distressed when, and creased her brow when she met me, but she did talk to Pekarik. <clears throat> and so there were those people. And, um, but there were other people who we really had to speak to, Gary Foley at the Aboriginal Arts Board, um, who started to sound oppositional. So I rang an old connection of mine, Charles Perkins, and he said, don't worry, I'll have a bit of a yarn with him. Now, in, in Perkins' language, that means something quite serious. Uh, so that, that barrier was cleared. <coughs> uh, I kept detailed records of all of these meetings, uh, uh, and uh, including with um, uh, people who weren't in the show or weren't directly involved, but they were part of the scene, and we needed to um, tick a few boxes. So I, I have actually created a detailed uh, Word document timeline giving dates and places and names for all of these things, just so that the history is there. Mm. Um, I think, yeah, it's just important to have that, that context. It wasn't an uncontested space in Australia that, that, you know, the museum stepped into. There were art galleries who, for decades and decades, had ignored Aboriginal art or had not engaged with it as art. 
And then you have museums who've been collecting this material and working with artists for you know, 150 years in the case of, of the museum that we work with. Um, so there's this, and I think this will come out in the discussion later today, but there is this really unhelpful opposition between the ethnographic and the fine art that is playing out in the creation of Dreamings and still plays out in some rather unsophisticated arguments, probably both in Australia and overseas. And, and I think if there is a legacy to Dreamings, it needs to be provoking that intellectual debate about Aboriginal creative practice not being defined by anyone's disciplinary or institutional boundaries. And again, that's something that we're wrestling with in America. Um, I think um, there, was a, there was a little moment in the Festival of Arts in Adelaide, um, Peter, which before we head back to New York, I thought you might want to just reflect on, um, uh, you were all there. Yeah, this was like a dry run um, or a preliminary bout. This is in March of 88. And uh, that's Michael Nelson Giacomari. Might as well go to the next slide or two or three. I've cut out some of them. Um, oh, I see. This that is a, one, this that is one a, I couldn't cut. Guy. This is a young and handsome version of John Munro. <laughs> um, he's probably listening to a stupid question before giving a gracious answer. Um, <clears throat> and um, Marcia Langton, that's myself looking young. I actually used to like that shirt. Different shirt. It's good. <laughs> no, I've still got it as a duster. <clears throat> um, Marcia Langton uh, was an old, an old connection <clears throat> and um, she was there as well. She's a political firebrand, uh, as some of you may know. <clears throat> and she was actually, when the Asian Society put up its uh, details of who was to speak at the symposium, <clears throat> a two-day symposium, Marcia was on, on it, <clears throat> but she couldn't make it for some reason. And so uh, I think Kerry Giles came as mm. instead. Yeah. Um, so wheeling back around to, this is one of my favourite photos from uh, the many photos that I've been ploughing through over, over the last month from Dreamings. Is there a happier human on the planet than Chris Anderson in this photo? Um, I think this brings us back to, I think, what for me is a really incredible part of this show, which is the presence of the artists and, and their place in, at the heart of the art world in 1988. And that experience, which which, yeah, shouldn't be romanticised, but should be interrogated and celebrated and, and held up as really the first time this, this had been done in Australia, let alone in America. Um, and so, Francoise, you know, you were, you were sort of meditating a little bit then on not romanticising these experiences, but you'll all have some amazing stories about um, what being in New York meant, what seeing the art world that these artists, their works had been going into for a time now, and it was making real you know, that other world. Um, did you want to say some more on, on that, not romanticising that, but also some good stories? Some good stories. Uh, so this photograph is wonderful, but also really sad because they all passed away. Um, so there's a little bit of a, mm. a sadness. Um, so on the left was Dolly and her daughter June, um, and I'd, I'd been working with them for a very long time. Actually, June taught me how to use a computer in 1985. So bringing them to New York for them was really interesting to, as I said, to see on a large scale um, because they've been participating in art shows, they've been participating in gallery shows before, but on a large scale, seeing all of, or at least a large amount of Aboriginal art from Australia uh, displayed in New York. And their interest was, um, they've never been to such a large city. And um, I realized that uh, they were um, really looking at New York for icons. So June, you know, she knew where John Lennon was shot and she wanted to see the Dakota building, as Chris had mentioned. But she had some kind of really interesting idea of, you know, why he was shot. So she had her own story. Uh, her mother had absolutely no idea who John Lennon was. <clears throat> so that was... Um, so what they did is that they really noticed poverty in New York. They really noticed the homeless population. And they, on day three, they had decided that I had to um, get as many blankets as I could from New Yorkers. 
and we would go out in Central Park and distribute them. So you can imagine, you know, it's like, okay, how am I going to answer that one? That's going to be really tough. In 1988, this is, you know, kind of the Reagan years where all the homeless population is out. So they did, they did really notice, um, you know, the poverty, the homelessness. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's, so, you know, they were really aware of, what, of the differences between going to the Asia Society and going into the streets uh, of New York City. So the Asia Society, they were literally assaulted by um, spiritual people who just wanted to give them stones. And June used to pile up all the stones in all her pocket. And at night, she would just take them all out and said to me, Nangala, why are they giving me stones? I have no idea what's going on. So we had, you know, sort of serious moment. My favorite moment is that there's a journalist from, I um, can't remember which magazine, comes in with a photographer and wants June to eat a banana while she's going to take a photograph. This is a true story. <clears throat> I escorted her out, not very nicely. Uh, but June really, you know, June really understood what was, you know, what was going on here. Um, so, yeah, so they, they, you know, they had their own uh, interests. Now, the fact that they were with all of us in New York City was also making it very comfortable. Yeah. Right? I mean, everybody could hide behind Chris because he's tall, <laughs> and everybody did. Right? Um, so, you know, there, there was a zone of comfort. There was they, were, they, they wanted to engage, you know, along with us. And during the symposium, which I think the crowd, you know, remarked, and Fred Myers has written about this as well, is that they wanted us to talk, mm. not them, right? So they wanted, they, they were using us to trans. I mean, they were using us to translate what was going on. Well, I think that's that a idea really of translation point that came out yesterday. Right. I think from from John that sense that you have um, a bunch of people speaking five or six different Aboriginal languages, acting as, as companions, mediators, interlocutors, in a way that, that doesn't speak for those artists, but actually allows their voice and their comfort to be expressed in a, in a pretty alien environment. Well, that's a very distinct aspect of this whole event, was that the curatorial team members, who were not Indigenous by birth, spoke among them five different Aboriginal languages. <clears throat> you would never get that in an art show that was just an art show. That's an investment of decades of your life in each case. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I had something else to say there, Will. That's, that's my leather jacket, the, the me on the second from the right, which I, I, after her insistence, I have now left in my will to Francoise. I actually, I actually tried to tap Peter for that jacket when I arrived at the museum, and he said it's already in my will for Francoise. It's an amazing jacket. I didn't want the t-shirt, but no. um, now, Chris, you wanted yeah, to say I just something. I had a about quick story about this once again about the artist interpretation in, uh, of New York City. A after this photo, Jimmy Woolaloo on the right there, he said to me, "Oh, it's too cold up here. You know, let's go somewhere else." So I took him to the souvenir shop, which is a coffee shop. I this is on the 110th floor, the, the, the uh, yeah, yeah. and we well, went, we went down a couple of levels to the coffee shop, and there's all sorts of souvenirs there, and of course, looming large in the souvenirs is, is King Kong, and, and Woolaloo started looking around the shop and saw, saw the displays of all these King Kong t-shirts, and he said, hey, you see that? And I said, yeah. He said, that's bullshit or what? <laughs> and he, re he, before he came on his outstation with the old DV, uh, what do you call it, the video player, he had seen the remake of King Kong and it dawned on him where we were. And he wanted to know, did that really happen? Because all of a sudden, it, it used to be a movie and now he's there right in the, the middle of this scene. So he, he wanted to know, you know, was it, did it really happen? <laughs> Well, and it's, it's not so far-fetched. I was doing some research with Yongu um, at Yikala in the last couple of years in another exhibition, and there was one project that had to go out to the Wessel Islands, and some of the, uh, some of the artists who were supposed to go out to this island didn't go because there had been, I think, a Macassan shipwreck out there 100, 200 years before, and some monkeys had allegedly, from the boat, got onto the island <coughs> and become giant monkeys that now terrified the people of Arnhem Land. There was this island off the coast that had giant King Kong kind of 
instruments. So those stories continue to circulate in, in Northern Australia. Um, Story is a critical uh, concept in this whole domain because the, the paintings and the carvings that we showed were all stories. And in the sort of deeper metaphysics of Aboriginal tradition, in a sense, everything is story. The landscape is a narrative. There is no, there is no wilderness. There's no nature versus culture. The whole landscape is impregnated with story. And so that was a base, one of the basic elements we tried to convey. I want to emphasize with this photo the secondary role of the curators here. The <laughs> artists are carrying suitcases and the senior curator is carrying dirty laundry yeah, like yeah. in a garbage bag. <laughs> I think we saw this one can, yesterday. Can I, can I say something about this one because I think it's, it's really relevant. So you see the person who is selling flowers in the back is actually Yanomamo person. And um, so that... From you know, the Amazon. Yeah, from Amazon. From the Amazon, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So not only, you know, some, I mean, some, some of them realized that this was, you know, an indigenous person, but where I was staying with um, all the group of um, artists and June and Dali, there was at the time the new musical Serafina. Anybody have seen that? Right. So Serafina's entourage, they had mates who were, Kung, so who are also hunters and gatherers. And at some point I found myself in an elevator with two hunters and gatherers from Australia and two hunters and gatherers from South Africa who were just like eyeing uh, one another and one in language telling me, are they from uh, the God Must Be Crazy movie? Mm -hmm. And the other one in English asking me, are they Aboriginal women from Australia? So you, from this was New York, you know, yeah. this, was, this was New York, you had, three different kind of, uh, you know, indigenous people recognizing one another. That was just an unbelievable moment. And then with African-Americans too. We went up, we all went as a big group up into Harlem. You know, the Asia Society people was like, no, oh, don't go there, no, you'll get robbed. And, and so we walked around Harlem with the local Harlemites eyeing these guys off and figuring, wait a minute, they're black people, but they don't look like us, you know? And then ultimately we ended up in Sylvia's uh, soul food restaurant. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and the whole of the kitchen staff coming out to see us. And it turned out that the chef at Sylvia's at the time had, had been in the U.S. Army in Darwin at the end of the Second World War. And, and uh, I think, was it Woolaloo or Malangi? Uh, Malangi. Malangi, the older Aboriginal artist, had worked for the U.S. Army uh, in, in Darwin. And because it was segregated, you know, they had the, the U.S. had the black soldiers over here and the white soldiers over here. They had Aboriginal people, you know, doing all the, the work in the camps. And so they talked for half an hour after that about the old days of Darwin. Hmm. So there's that aspect of it as well. Um, Peter, did you just want to reflect on Kerry's participation and involvement? Kerry Giles was um, what in the language of the time was called an urban Aboriginal artist. She uh, was living in the Adelaide region in South Australia. She had become an established artist. Um, so she's part of the, um, part of the, um, the proof that the exhibition ignored um, Aboriginal artists who weren't traditionally um, oriented. <clears throat> but we did have to make a decision. <clears throat> you know, the exhibition only had about 105 things in it, paintings and other objects. We decided to take, <clears throat> to give the American audience the basics first, the classical traditions as reflected in pretty current and some old work. <clears throat> but we didn't ignore the, the more recent and very, in fact, quite in its very early stage, the Aboriginal art movement of the cities. <clears throat> and in the catalogue, you'll find multiple images done by those artists. You'll find the, at least seven urban Aboriginal artists are named. Um, and we did uh, talk with a number of them. <clears throat> uh, even Tracy Moffat, who in my diary appears as Tracy Morfitt, um, who I didn't know, uh, was on my list of people to contact in 87 with Pekarik. <clears throat> but we had to make some kind of a selection for the the 
exhibition, but when it came to the catalogue, we were able to branch out. So that this is why the two, the exhibition and the catalogue, have slightly different names. The exhibition was Dreamings Art from Aboriginal Australia, and the catalogue was called Dreamings The Art of Aboriginal Australia, because it was much more a survey. Um, I'll skip through these for now. We can come back to these. Um, if we have time. Peter's, Peter's sketched out everything for 40 years or so, so <laughs> his archive of drawings is going to be a part of the South Australian Museum's legacy for some Kluge Roo intern or someone who wants to get stuck in it. I'll come, I'm just flagging this for now. I think what I would like to end on, we've, we've got about 15 minutes, is to look at um, what you're flagging there in, in Kerry's involvement and in, you know, we saw a, a slide of Michael Riley, one of the most important Aboriginal artists uh, of recent decades, who was actually a filmmaker uh, as part of the project. Um, it, that one of the critiques or one of, and, and legitimately so, is, you know, where are, where are the, the Aboriginal artists who don't identify as uh, in these traditional classical traditions and how are they excluded or not through this process. And it's a legitimate critique of dreamings, um, but also I think it's a really interesting talking with Henry, Margot, and some of Peter's comments about there was, I think, an agenda to open the door in America and, and how do you create a language or a literacy for American public in a tradition that they know nothing about. And there's some, some choices had to be made. Um, but I'm interested in, in reflecting uh, with, with each of you on what we haven't spoken a lot about is the reception of the show itself um, and the, the critical and public engagement with um, that moment in New York. I think we, we're all aware of the debates post then, but I think knowing about that moment and going back to that moment and grounding ourselves in a very specific exhibition, you know, with, with and a huge impact and legacy is really important before we spiral into the abstractions of it. Um, so I think, and maybe one of the, we can talk about the, uh, this is the New York Times article that came with it. This is another of my favorite Peter Sutton photos. Why do photographers say, please take your glasses off? <laughs> then I couldn't see where they were. <laughs> it's because you look 18. I was 42 the, there, yeah, by the way. He looks like he's 18. He does. I'm 41 and I look 10 times older than that now. Right. That is the same shirt, I reckon, that you were wearing at the Adelaide <laughs> and Festival. And that's the leather jacket too. There's only three garments that Peter Sutton is wearing throughout this whole year period. <laughs> There's the stripy t-shirt, this shirt and the jacket. Well, I, I was used to doing long-term field work in a world with no bathrooms. <laughs> um, I, you I, wanted to mention Osa Brown? I do want to mention Osa Brown. She was an indefatigably hard worker. She was the fix-it person for all the complex web of relationships between conservation, borrowing, airfares, insurance, you name it. She, she, was, uh, she, worked, she worked like, as we say in Australia, she worked like a cattle dog. Um, <clears throat> she flew to Australia. She was a perfectionist. She got me to New York to spend two days with the book designer. Um, uh, to, in terms of placement of text versus imagery, and I had a strong aesthetic sense of how a book should look. Um, so we had a few arguments. <clears throat> but um, <clears throat> she, uh, just to give you an example of the quality control of this event, <clears throat> in flying to Australia to do the lending arrangements and all the rest of it, the conservation, she brought with her a large set of swatches and she went to each of the paintings and the images that we had in the show and recorded matching swatch uh, densities and hue and so on for particular parts of the paintings and then photographed them. Then when Topan in Tokyo were printing the book, she flew to, 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 to uh, Topan and sat there with her swatches as each coloured image for the book came up on the screen She'd say, no, a bit more, a bit more, no, 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 back, 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 okay, plug it in there. And they had two separate switches at the end, end of the table. And that's why that book is colour perfect in terms of the original objects. I've seen some of those same images reproduced, for example, in the University of Chicago History of Cartography, where I had two chapters, and it looks like something has been in the mud for about three weeks. 
it, it is really good. It is an incredibly well colour matched uh, book. I know because I get to see these paintings in our stores all the time and it's rare uh, in an Aboriginal art book to have such dedication to the colour matching. Um, again, 1988 was, was a good year. Um, so coming back to this sense of the, the moment and the actual exhibition, the actual people, the, the reception and the responses to it, um, maybe Chris, if you want to talk about this, because I think this is a really important part of the show too. Um, just a preliminary, one of the most extraordinary things about the whole show was that, you know, you would have thought that Bruce Springsteen came to the Asia Society. There were queues all the way around the block uh, to get into not just the exhibition, but this symposium and this uh, particular part of it, which was the sand painting uh, done by, that's, uh, Bill Stockman, Jabal Jai on the left, and Michael Nelson, Jakamara on the right, uh, both from Papunya. Um, oh boy, the stories, if I had a glass of wine, I could talk all day about, uh, about this event. But just two things I wanted to mention. Um, you see the white substance. It's a wamalu. It's a, it's a wild daisy, and, and, and they pick it and dry it, and it's used for, in body painting, uh, sort of daubed onto the body. But we had to bring it from uh, Yundamu, and John Mundine was the carrier of this big bag of white substance. The courier. And that, that, <laughs> and that combined with his dreadlocks meant that customs took a yeah, special interest in him. <laughs> um, and then the other one we had to deal with was how do we get uh, replicate the red sand of Central Australia? And we found a sand dealer on Long Island that had we, had, we actually had, I think, five tonnes of Long Island red sand dumped on the Asia Society floor. Um, but, and this was an interesting one, and it's written up in the literature because we had several people, at least one kind of uh, gallery owner come art critic, come academic, come asshole, who, um, who said that uh, we, in particular, were, were uh, interceding between the artists and the audience. Um, and that we, you know, we were falsely representing them, and we didn't, have, we were colonialists, and so on. But what what he didn't know was that uh, we're backstage when they're getting ready to start, and uh, Giacomo says to me, "Hey, John B. Jimba, that, that's what he calls me. John B. Jimba, listen, this is your country. We don't want to talk to these people out there. You tell them. We, we've taught you and Nangala well, and you can explain these things. We don't want to talk to them." And and it was really brought home that that was a successful tactic because. At the end of their first day, they were mobbed by, you know, little old blue rinse ladies who had rocks that they wanted to rub, and, and, and they came up to us and said, could we touch them? You know, it was really a bizarre situation. Um, and my last thing is, is more on the symposium prior to this, where um, Dolly Granitz explained in her language, and Francois translated, about the coming of the white man and, and what had happened and so on. And, and in question time, a lady, a New Yorker, got up in the audience, she said, do you mean to tell me there are people in Australia other than Aborigines? <laughs> and with that comment, she sort of wiped clean 300 years of colonialism. You know, there, there were only Aboriginal people in Australia. I thought that was a wonderful display of uh, all too common uh, American ignorance of geography, but, but also you know, a fantastic statement for the artists when we translated what they, they said. Uh, they laughed and laughed and laughed. But they, and then, sorry, last one. They're, 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 they have um, ochre, um, karku? On, on them, which is a, a, a red mineral substance, high in silica, beautiful sheen to it, and it's very hard to get off. So we go home. And, and I had to bring it. Thank that's you. That's right, you brought that one. Customs didn't stop you, though. No, I'm blonde. Yeah. But, um, and white. We, we go white home chunk. and we're staying in a hotel suite, and there was John Keane, who was a, a Papunya advisor, and myself, and these two guys. And, you know, they, they take a shower and they sit down. And on the couch and in the bed and, you know, towels and everything. And the next morning we go to the Asia Society for the second day and I get a call. It's the man hotel manager and he said, I have to talk to you. We think there's been a murder in your room. <laughs> And, and because these ochre soaked towels and sheets and we had to pay for a new couch because of, 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 of the guy sitting, sitting there. So. And its symbolism traditionally is blood. Yeah. I, th I think, in all seriousness, I think we learned a lot at Dreamings 
to learn how to talk to an audience who did not know anything about Aboriginal people. So that's also an ongoing legacy. And, um, you know, and there were lots of debates and there were lots of attacks and there were a lot of praises, et cetera. Um, it, it was intense. It was very much intense. And thank God, um, you know, Fred Myers with a group of his uh, graduate students videotaped the entire event. So we have, you know, we have a lot of um, material and Fred wrote really kind of a beautiful analysis and ethnography of, um, you know, of the event. So th I think that has really, that's why Dreaming's legacy is so important because so many of the issues that we're still struggling today, you know, how do you, and I, you know, I've done that um, recently. I took a, I, I did a big show in Canada of Aboriginal art. It's really different. I mean, we're all grappling with this. And I think in Australia, people forgot about the issues that Dreaming's raised uh, at the time very fast, unfortunately, right? Yeah, yeah, there is, there is a bit of cultural or critical amnesia, I think, that we keep returning to in these discussions. And I think that's why this, this symposium is actually equally important in Australia and for our thinking as it is here in America, because, yeah, we can't keep re rehashing the same arguments. There has to be some uh, consciousness of what has happened and I think that's why looking at dreamings critically, but also with, with a human scale is really important. I mean, I think that just thinking about the actual curatorial uh, debates and questions, Peter, I mean, you mentioned there was a bit of a spinal tap Stonehenge moment, wasn't yes, there? Yes, there was. A, uh, when I was on one of my trips to New York, I was to sit down with uh, Chloe, the head designer and her team and talk about exhibition presentation. And I think before I got there, they had done this uh, syllogism. These are Stone Age people. Stonehenge is Stone Age. Therefore, it follows that we will put up a fake Stonehenge, which they did. <laughs> Big lintels, you know, stubby legs, the whole, the whole thing. And it was covered in red, uh, something like red ochre colour. And, um, and they said, and we'll have red ochre on the walls. And I said, that will kill the paintings that have red ochre in them because they will not stand out. In Art and Land, we had shown the, the tua, which are those little sculptures you see in that, that presentation box there on the left. We'd shown those against black velvet, spotlit, dominating the viewer. Anyway, I kind of won a bit of that argument, but as I, as I finished speaking, they all just took off again. And Andrew Pekarik said to me, Peter, you're in New York, you have to shout. <laughs> So I'm, I don't shout. Anyway, uh, the best presentation by far that I know of was the Adelaide one. I'm not boasting because of that. It was aesthetically intelligent. Uh, the background was reduced to a zero by a plain cream or some other color. The objects stood out, they were beautifully lit. And the presentation was faithful to the sequencing uh, the sequencing for the barks, at least, I had done myself by creating scale drawings on cardboard, and I sketched them. And I should mention, when we're talking about this art versus ethnography divide, that I was, in fact, a practicing Intaglio printmaker, um, and I'd been trained by two different artists, including Jürgen Schmeisser and um, uh, Rita Hall, and had a long-standing interest in the fine arts and Western art and Australian art history and so on. Um, and uh, so in terms of our backgrounds, it wasn't a simple anthropology versus the art world. One thing nobody's mentioned yet is that the Dreaming Show started in New York, but then went on to Chicago, uh, to Los Angeles, to Melbourne, and then finally to Adelaide. Mm. And the reason Peter got away with this, the stuff he's just talking about in the Adelaide Show is that, you know, that was our turf. We could do what we wanted to there. But I think we had like 100,000 visitors uh, through through the Dreaming Show in in Adelaide, which had you know never before been achieved in an exhibition. In no, and, and, and in New York, it was the biggest show the Asia Society had ever had, and they sold more copies of the catalogue than they'd ever sold copies of any catalogue. It stayed in print for eighteen years, and they sold, I think, thirty thousand. Um, now we thought it was ephemeral, and if you go to the postscript and read what I said there at the end, uh, I said, "Well, we've done this much. This is just the beginning." we have now created a vacuum that must be filled. 
Yeah, uh, look, and I think we, we've only got a couple of minutes left, but I think it is worth um, maybe getting each of you to reflect on that. I, I was reading the postscript of the catalogue um, in preparation for this, and and it's actually it's a beautiful statement of humility in the sense that I think the curators understood that there was something coming, that uh, there was something already happening that, uh, you know, as Henry Flagg in his introduction, some of it you knew and some of it you couldn't predict, but that Dreamings was a kind of sentinel being that flagged something that had been happening forever and something that was beginning again. And I wonder if, if each of you could maybe, we'll talk about this more in questions, I think, but reflect uh, for a minute on what you feel the legacy of Dreamings is. Maybe Francoise, you first. Well. It's ongoing. <laughs> I think Dreamings for me was just such a, you know, an, an incredible emotional, intellectual moment uh, in my early career. And um, I'm still, you know, struggling with some of the issues in on shows uh, that I have curated. So it's it's great. You know, it's, it leaves on. Thanks to Peter. Um, because, I mean, I think Peter had just the, you know, the practical, the intellectual foresight of what could become. I'll end with Peter, maybe Chris. Okay. Um, yeah, for me, it was an incredibly optimistic moment. You know, Australia's history is very dark in terms of the interaction with Indigenous peoples. <clears throat> and the Dreaming Show just kind of represented this, like a shift to optimism. Um, and, and then the, the other part of it too was, I think, on, the, on, on our side, um, I, it, was, it was the teamwork aspect. You know, ma many curators are very egocentric and, and sole operators, and they don't work well with other people, and that's fine. I mean, that's part of some t style of curatorial work. But we had a team of people that worked seamlessly together. Well, that didn't mean we didn't argue about things, but that teamwork was all very special. And then bringing in the Aboriginal artists as, as part of the team too. It, you know, it sounds trite, but it was a very, very integrated thing. And that was one of the lasting things that I have. Mm -hmm. Well, for, for me, the biggest lesson was how to think from a point of view of ignorance and how to write to people who don't know anything and still not treat them as children. Um, how do you convey something complex and deep and something that's mainly visual in words? And so adopting the point of view of the one who's intelligently interested but actually ignorant, um, that was the thing we had to do with the catalogue, we had to do it with the labels, the introductory sections, we had to do it with the pamphlets. I brought one to give to the Kluge Ru. I couldn't find the other one, it's, it's called Aesthetics, I wrote it. With each image, there is a punchline of something deep about the culture, as illustrated in the image. Um, and in terms of the writing of the catalogue, um, we're all we're all experienced at writing things. I'd already published several books myself, but um, we had a wonderful text editor called Judith Smith, who did it all for nothing. She was uh, uh, she was donating her services, and she would say, Peter. I don't know what you mean by that, you know. Look, I just got off the train from Tennessee. Tell me what that means, you know. She, she actually she lived in a, a, th a three-story brownstone walk-up in Manhattan, um, but she was extremely good at uh, getting rid of large Germanic paragraphs and replacing them with, and not going to the single sentence cigarette advertisement type of paragraph, but the one in between that is the, the, has the pacing that keeps the reader interested and doesn't tire them out too much. So in the symposium, we had to field dozens of questions from a New York audience, probably the best audience I've ever come across, apart from the one here today, of course. Um, it, they had done their homework. There were a few not so bright questions but I was knocked over by the sophistication of the questions. These were the people who were very interested. We came in on the tail end of the controversy over the primitivism exhibition, which had just been big news. I had read the book myself, the catalogue, I hadn't seen the exhibition. We came in on the tail end of the, I think, well, what, this is subjective and I, I'm subject to Terry Smith's correction here. Uh, there was a sense, there was an air in the Western art world of effeteness of uh, tiredness, 
that people were looking not just for more novelty, you could do that by going back to Dada, um, but they wanted something sincere, if you want to put it that way, something that meant something. If you look at a medieval Madonna and child, these were put together by people who believed in the Madonna and child, who worshipped them, prayed to them, got into session. They weren't just saying, here's a pretty picture of a woman and a baby. <clears throat> the aesthetic was bound up totally with the metaphysics and the commitment to a particular ontology and cosmology. And what these works represented, in a sense, was a breath of fresh air. And on that very eloquent summary of everything that this means, um, I'm going to draw to an end this session. Um, and encourage you all to uh, save those, what we're anticipating to being the greatest set of questions that any American audience has ever asked, um, uh, for the questions, but also for tomorrow's session, where you'll have an opportunity to spend time in the Kluge Roo uh, talking through these issues in greater, with greater expansion with each of these three amazing people. Uh, it's been a very great privilege to share the stage with each of you uh, and to thank share you, this John. story. Yeah, thanks, John. So, thank you, John. Um, please thank these amazing people. Don't worry. Don't worry. Uh, I will say I'm not moving. What a humbling experience uh, to hear from s such legends in the field. Dreamings has incredible legacies, but for it to have legacies, those legacies have to live on. Um, one of the things listening to you today made me realize one change in the last 30 years is that we have begun to think of curating as its own discipline, right? It's as, as a form of research, as something that can produce new knowledge. Uh, and that's something we're really committed to here at the Kluge Roo. So tomorrow, when you uh, when we finish the symposium, hearing again uh, from, from Peter, Francois, and Chris, uh, it will be in the context of an exhibition that was curated by nine graduate students in the art history department at UVA. Uh, over the course of a semester, those nine students delved deep into dreamings, spoke, um, spoke with all of the uh, panelists here and produced an exhibition that really tried to um, think very broadly about what those legacies were. So today we've got something really special. Uh, amongst hearing from legends like John Mundine, Peter Sutton, we're also going to have uh, one of our graduate student curators, Eleanor Newman, uh, deliver a paper. Eleanor is currently a PhD in uh, the McIntyre Department of Art here at the UVA. Uh, normally, when she's not studying Aboriginal Australian art, she studies 18th and 19th century British art and visual culture. And she is presenting her paper, Making Their Own Mark, Collecting Indigenous Australian Art in the United States Since Dreaming. So please uh, welcome Eleanor to the stage. <laughs> Thank you, Henry and Margot, for having me here today. I would also like to start by acknowledging the Monacan people. As Fred Myers is unable to be here today, and I am here in his stead, I will start by quoting him. Last spring, my eight colleagues and I from the Department of Art and Architectural History here at UVA conducted interviews with many of our esteemed speakers while preparing for the exhibition Beyond Dreamings. When we spoke with Fred Myers, he said that the 1988 exhibition Dreamings at the Asia Society Galleries in New York was, quote, very significant for Kluge, but also a lot of other buyers in that it produced this sort of ripple effect. That ripple effect is the focus of my talk. Kluge first purchased works of Australian Aboriginal art in 1989, just months after seeing Dreamings. And within a decade, he opened the Kluge Roo collection here at the University of Virginia. 
The story of that incredible feat belongs to a larger narrative about the meteoric rise of American interest in Aboriginal art following Dreamings. And many of you were there for significant pieces of that story. In addition to Kluge, Donald P. Kahn and Will, and Will Owen and Harvey Wagner began acquiring Aboriginal art, and they were followed by a second wave of collectors in the 1990s. This was only made possible, of course, by the flourishing art market that arose first in Australia and then in the United States. As will be seen, these collectors quickly dedicated themselves to organizing exhibitions and accompanying catalogs for receptive American public that had been primed by the popular success of Dreamings. The exhibition's institutional legacy is arguably one of its most significant. Public and university art museums, such as the Kluge Roo, are now home to many of the collections that formed in the wake of Dreamings. Though the first two major collections of Aboriginal art in the United States predated Dreamings, that of Ed Roo and Richard Kelton, the exhibition was a catalyst for new collectors. Kahn, Kluge, and Owen and Wagner all encountered Western Desert acrylic paintings from the 1970s and 80s for the first time upon visiting Dreamings. Aided by the positioning of the objects in the exhibition as art rather than ethnography, they saw the paintings as contemporary art akin to the Western contemporary art some of them already collected. When Kahn, a philanthropist and heir to the Annenberg Communications Empire, saw the exhibition, he apparently made the decision to start collecting in the gallery while admiring three of the nearly 30 Western Desert paintings on view. Michael Nelson Giacomara's Five Stories, Mick Namarari Jabaljari's Wallaby Dreaming, and John Warankula Juparula's Bushfire Dreaming. Giacomara's Five Stories can be, can be seen here in the installation photograph alongside a case of toas. Reminiscing about that moment, Kahn wrote, these paintings impressed me to a degree that I have not often experienced. For him, the impression was made visually as the art spoke for itself. Kahn immediately started collecting Western Desert paintings. He had not previously collected art, and so he sought advice from Francoise Dussart. Um, and Andrew Picaric, then director of the Asia Society, recommended that Kahn visit Tambourin Gallery in New York. Founded prior to the exhibition in 1979 by the Australian Marine Zarember, the gallery specialized in African, Oceanic, and Native American art from the Northwest Coast. There, Kahn purchased his first five paintings. He traveled to Australia six months later, where he bought from private galleries popping up in Sydney, as well as Warlang Kalungu Artist um, Aboriginal Corporation in Yundamu. He also purchased the masterpiece Combination of Five Stories of Places in the Arnipipe Country, which Norbert Lynch and Ware, um, by Norbert Lynch and Ware from Sotheby's in 1989. John Kluge, here on the left, uh, founder of Metro Media, would have seen Shorty Luncarda uh, Jungarai's Pattern in Sand when he visited Dreamings. The painting can be seen on um, the left in the photograph, the installation photograph. Um, in the, in the gallery. Within three months, he traveled to Australia and made his first acquisitions. Maurice Tuckman, then head of contemporary art at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, encouraged Kluge and his wife Patricia to go and even traveled with them. Tuckman had started working with the Klugies as early as 1984, advising on their collection of contemporary art by California artists. Kluge was similarly attracted to the aesthetic of Western desert paintings, and as a businessman, he considered it an appealing investment. For Kluge, if it was, quote, uh, if it wasn't safe art, that was part of the attraction. Tuckman had previously spent two weeks in Australia in 1988 studying Aboriginal art. He also visited Dreamings and attended the symposium held in conjunction with the exhibition when he met John Mundine, who was then at Bula Bula Arts in Remanginning, along with the artist David Malangi and Jimmy Wululu. As we heard from John Mundine last night, Tuckman was already planning Kluge's first trip and he surprised them when he asked if Kluge would need a bodyguard in Ramming Gidding. Recalling Kluge's visit to Australia, Tuckman said he looked at some 4,000 paintings while there. Kluge eventually purchased around 60 works, including paintings such as Anajari Giacomara's Artist Country Near Kolkata from Papunya Tula Artist, seen on the right of the installation photograph as well as a large group of Pamagini, or traditional armbands and headbands, from Tiwi Pima Art on Bathurst Island, three of which can be seen on the right. 
On the same trip, his first commission was conceived when he met John, minus the bodyguard, but apparently plus a shotgun, as we heard last night, uh, in Ramanginning. John suggested a commission of bark paintings based on clan designs from the Yuritsha and Dua Moedis. The Ramanginning Commission was hugely ambitious, and most of the 123 works that resulted were monumental in scale, such as Andrew Margululu's Dua Honey Story, seen here. John wrote in a letter to Kluge that many are the largest bark paintings seen for quite some time, and the subjects are some not seen by the outside world before. The artist also produced small jewel-like barks, such as Charlie Machui Burrowanga's Ganini on the left, and Mickey During Garawura's uh, Jane Kawu sister's water holes at Gariak seen on the right. These were better suited for domestic display, as was um, as was Ralph uh, Genjamir's Diarrhea Dreaming, which, as you can see here, hung in the dining room of the Kluge's home. And Margot reminded me this morning that the juxtaposition of dining and diarrhea um, was a bit unfortunate. <laughs> I should also say that all the works, uh, that many of the works I just mentioned um, are currently on view in Beyond Dreaming, so you can see them in the gallery. Kluge also made many acquisitions at galleries in Australia and the US with Tuckman acting as his agent. By the late 1980s, a number of private galleries specializing in indigenous art were established in major Australian cities. Among these was Gallery Gabrielle Pizzi in Melbourne, op opened by Pizzi in 1987 with an inaugural exhibition of Western desert painting. Her gallery was among the first where Tuckman purchased art on Kluge's behalf. In the United States, galleries in New York and Los Angeles were the first to start selling Aboriginal art. From Carol Lopez's Kaz Gallery in Los Angeles, Tuckman acquired works such as Dick Jackala's Kangaroo of the Ubar Ceremony, seen here on the left, and um, also in view at the Kluge Room. Prior to Dreamings in 1988, Kaz held an exhibition of around 200 works titled Dreams in Life, which was heralded as the largest grouping of Aboriginal art ever displayed in the US. The following year in New York, the well-known contemporary art dealer, John Weber, organized Papunya Tula, contemporary paintings from Australia's Western Desert. It included the work of Anat Jari Giacomaro, who was featured later that year in a solo exhibition at the gallery, the first solo exhibition of an Aboriginal artist in a New York gallery. That year, Kluge purchased Giacomaro's Women Dreaming near Kiwikura from John Weber, which is seen here on the right. In the catalog for his Papunya Tula exhibition, Weber acknowledged that, quote, although a few corporations and private collectors have amassed significant holdings in the field, the collections are specialized and few crossovers occur. Kluge, however, had encyclopedic ambitions for his collection. As such, when he had the opportunity to purchase the specialized collection, library, and archives of Ed Rue, he outbid all of the other interested buyers, individuals, and institutions alike. Kluge officially acquired the collection from Rue's estate in 1993. That same year, he was also able to buy Pattern and Sand, which he first saw in Dreamings. Combining his holdings with Rue's, helped Kluge to create what was then the largest private collection outside Australia. Will Owen and Harvey Wagner also began collecting after seeing the West Western Desert paintings and dreamings. Owen was a scholar and librarian at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and Wagner was a scholar, professor, and former dean at UNC's Keenan Flagler Business School and a longtime consultant at McKinsey and Company. Encouraged by a friend who owned a gallery in Soho, they visited Dreamings. Unlike Kahn and Kluge, who immediately started collecting, Owen and Wagner waited two years before they traveled to Australia to make their first purchase. And they were much more restrained. At the end of their trip, they acquired only one painting by Wayne Bright Jangala titled Rockhole Dreaming, seen here on the, on the right. In the 1980s, Owen and Wagner had collected color field painting and minimalist works by contemporary American artists. And so they were readily attracted to Western desert painting, and it aligned with their taste and collecting interests. Over the course of the next 20 years, Owen and Wagner grew a comprehensive yet diverse collection of contemporary indigenous Australian art that eventually totaled about 900 works. As opposed to large-scale paintings that could be exhibited in a museum, they focused on collecting smaller ones suitable for their home. Their first commission transpired in 1999 when they emailed Liam Campbell, then um, arts advisor at Wurlingu Artists. 
Campbell encouraged the artist Patty Jepeljari Stewart to make a painting in the style of his, um, of his work on the renowned Yundamu school doors, which resulted in possum dreaming seen on the left. Owen and Wagner were also encouraged to purchase Andrea Nungarai Martin's Native Cat and Possum Dreaming, a painting of the same story in a different style by a younger artist. Every couple of years, they returned to Australia on purchasing trips during which they acquired work from galleries in Alice Springs, Darwin, Melbourne, Perth, and Sydney. They also bought directly from community art centers when possible, working closely with art advisors like Daphne Williams and Paul Sweeney from Papunya, Papunya Tula Artists. A second wave of collecting Aboriginal art in the United States commenced in the 1990s. Though these collectors were not directly inspired by a visit to Dreamings, they benefited from the expertise of the collectors who did, as well as the art market that grew in the exhibition's wake. Fred Myers gave a specific example when he said that, quote, Kluge's collection and standing probably reinforced John Wilkerson's interest in buying Aboriginal art because he must have consulted with Kluge when he started to buy. He bought a lot of work on the secondary market. The Wilkerson's worked with the Australian dealer Irene Sutton of Sutton Art Gallery and Tim Klingender of Sotheby's Australia to amass their collection of nearly 50 early boards painted by the original Papunya Tula artists. Sutton purchased numerous boards on their behalf at Sotheby's Australia auction of important Aboriginal art in 1997, which showcased 40 early boards, one of the largest groupings yet seen. The Wilkerson's passion for indigenous Australian art also led them to amass an important collection of nearly 50 shields, including the three seen here in the installation photograph of Beyond Dreamings. Uh, Margaret Levy and Robert Kaplan also bought on the secondary market, but they focused on purchasing directly from the community art centers. Their collection grew to more than 500 early and contemporary works by artists from Arnhem Land, the Central and Western Deserts, the Kimberley, the Southeast, and the Torres Strait. After visiting the Art Gallery of New South Wales in 2004, Dennis Scholl wrote that the paintings he and his wife Deborah saw possessed a visual complexity that was, quote, so damn beautiful we couldn't live without it. The Scholls first acquired art from the galleries and auction houses like Sotheby's Australia, but they later began to purchase and commission work from artists and their art centers in order to direct their financial support. Their collection eventually grew to around 400 works of contemporary Aboriginal art. And finally, beginning in 2006, Agatha and Stephen Luxo worked closely with the gallerist uh, Julie Harvey, director of Harvey Art Projects in Ketchum, Idaho, to build their collection of around 200 contemporary paintings from Central and Western Deserts, uh, from the Central and Western Deserts, as well as carvings from Central Arnhem Land and the Tiwi Islands dating to the 1950s and 1960s. Perhaps inspired by the overwhelming positive public reception of Dreamings, nearly every major collector has devoted themselves to presenting their collections through public exhibitions and associated catalogs. Donald Kahn was the first of the major collectors from the 1980s to share his collection publicly. He started acquiring Aboriginal art because he, quote, wanted to make a little mark by collecting something excellent and allowing people to see it. Khan set out to build a collection that would be small enough to tour as an exhibition, but large enough to provide a survey of Western desert painting. He eventually held an exhibition at Munich's Museum Villa Stuck in 1994, for which the extensive catalog, Dreamings, was produced. John Kluge exhibited his collection in the 1991 exhibition, Dreamtime, Australian Aboriginal Art from the collection of John W. Kluge at what is now the Tubman Museum of Art in Roanoke, Virginia. In conjunction with the opening in 1999, the Kluge Roos monumental exhibition, Art from the Land, was organized in addition to the important catalog produced for it. And Owen and Wagner's collection was featured in the exhibition and catalog, Crossing Cultures, which was held in 2012 to celebrate the first significant gifts, their first significant gifts to the Hood Museum at Dartmouth College in Hanover, New Hampshire. From the second wave, the Wilkerson's were the first to present their collection of early boards from Papunya Tula with icons of the desert in 2009 at the Johnson Museum of Art at Cornell University. The Levy Kaplan collection was exhibited in Ancestral Modern in 2012 at the Seattle Art Museum. The Shoals followed with twin exhibitions and catalogs at the Nevada Museum of Art, No Boundaries in 2014 and Marking the Infinite in 2016. Most recently, the Luxo's donation to the Kluge Roo was the focus of the exhibition and catalog, Songs of a Secret Country in 2017. 
The desire of these collectors to share Aboriginal art has in many ways culminated in the donation of part or all of their co collection to public and university art museums. Some have, of course, chosen to divest their holdings at auction, uh, such as Khan, who sold 10 works, including combination of five stories, at Sotheby's Australia auction of Aboriginal and Oceanic art in July 2010. That painting uh, was subsequently bought by the Shoals at what turned out to be one of Sotheby Australia's biggest auctions of indigenous art ever. However, the majority of the major collectors from the 1980s and 90s have chosen to donate rather than sell. A number of public museums, including the Seattle Art Museum, Nevada Museum of Art, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art have been the beneficiaries of gifts from Levy and Kaplan, the Shoals, and the Luxos. Notably, the largest institutional collections are at university art museums. The most momentous gifts have come from two of the three major collectors who visited Dreamings. As we know, Kluge gave the majority of his collection to the Kluge Rue Aboriginal Art Collection here at the University of Virginia, and Owen and Wagner eventually donated their entire collection to the Hood Museum of Art at Dartmouth College. Following suit, the Shoals gave 90 works to the Frost Art Museum at their alma mater, Florida International University in Miami. As early as 1989, Kluge had planned to open a museum dedicated to Aboriginal art in the US. At first, he considered building a private museum, but he then decided that the collection would be best served at a university where it could be studied um, as well as exhibited. The presence of the two surnames in the museum's appellation speaks to the two very different collecting practices that formed the collection, but also Kluge and Rue's mutual desire to share their collections with a university community. Ed Rue was pioneering in his donation of a bark painting to the Spencer Museum of Art at the University of Kansas, where he was a professor only to find it was later transferred to the university's um, anthropology collection. The Kluge Rue is now the largest institutional collection of indigenous Australian art in the US with around 1900 objects. The Hood Museum of Art became the second largest institutional collection when Owen and Wagner donated their entire collection in installments between 2009 and 2017. Through the highly influ influential blog started by Owen in 2005, Aboriginal Art and Culture and American Eye, they met Brian Kennedy, who later became the Hood Museum's director. Their donation of nearly 900 works has made the museum an important center for the study and exhibition of indigenous Australian art. Our own Henry Skerritt curated their recent exhibition, uh, or current exhibition, A World of Relations from the Owen and Wagner Collection. In conclusion, Dreamings indisputably catalyzed the collecting of Aboriginal art in the United States. From the first glance at Western desert paintings on the walls of the Asia Society in New York, the collectors Donald Kahn, John Kluge, and Will, and Owen, Will Owen and Harvey Wagner were motivated to start collecting because the bright colors and patterns reflected their own aesthetic sensibilities. They saw Aboriginal art as contemporary art. Though the colorful marks on the surface of the paintings may have initially attracted them, deeper engagement with the art and the artist kept them collecting well after dreamings. Their passion helped inspire other collectors and motivated them to share their collections with American audiences, thereby making their own mark on the history of indigenous Australian art. Thank you. Okay, now I'm gonna invite um, John and Francois and Peter and uh, Chris back to the stage. I just, I, I, you know, we we spent the morning talking about 1988 and I love the fact that Eleanor's paper finished with a photo that was taken last week at the Hood Museum um, because talk about presenting, we're bringing it right up to the present. Um, Eleanor, that was fantastic, and I, I'm just um, I'm so proud. Uh, <laughs> I, um, it, it, it really speaks volumes to what we are trying to do here at the University of Virginia. Um, but you know, being, being uh, I don't know, quasi-academic, I'm going to correct you. We've now got over 2,000 objects, um, thanks to a recent donation uh, of, of 100 fiber works from uh, uh, Dr. Louise Hamby, uh, who, who, who's one of the foremost experts in fibre works. And I only raise that to say that this story is still continuing. And 
um, uh, you know, the, the, the Kluge Roos Commission, the Kluge Roos mission is not just to preserve the collection that John uh, Kluge and Ed Roo amassed, but that we are constantly trying to grow our collection uh, to make sure that we're telling this continuing story. Um, <coughs> Which is just a hint to people. Anyone wants to give us donations, we're always always welcoming. Um, but I'm going to hand over to these guys uh, and and John. Um, if anybody has any questions for them, so this is not one of the brilliant questions, but I didn't understand about the rocks being given to the artists in at the Dreaming in 1988? We didn't either. <laughs> well, there, you know, there were a lot of new age uh, movement going on in New York City. And um, several of the women who attended Asia Society were members of the Asia Society and were very involved in the new age you know, scene, which I did not know at all uh, in New York City. And the rocks apparently featured Imminently, and um, I beat myself up now because I should have done my due diligence and do a little bit more of anthropology and finding out from them who they were and why they thought that you know their message would resonate with um, indigenous people. And there is a uh, that's a fairly common delusional state. Um, He's much nicer than I. <laughs> and so. Um, I got myself together and wrote a paper called Aboriginal Spirituality in a New Age. This article has had the highest number of hits and downloads from that journal that's ever been done. Uh, my theory was that it, it was half California Googling, but it turns out to be probably mainly boring academics. But it's a systematic comparison of New Age philosophies, plural, with Aboriginal philosophies, more, more singular. And uh, the outcome, sadly, for the New Ages is that there's pretty much no resemblance. The, the stones were felt to have power, and they, they, they would buy these special stones, which is an irony because about 10 years before that was the pet rock movement. <laughs> <laughs> the pet rocks grew into magic stones, and they wanted to amplify the power by rubbing it on the Aboriginal people's artist's body. Hang on, there's, there's just one beforehand. Um, I just kind of noticed talking about um, understanding Aboriginal art as fine art and as this aesthetically beautiful thing, but then the tension of wanting to understand the stories behind those pieces. So I was wondering if you could just speak a little bit more about how to navigate that tension. And then also, I think it was Chris that mentioned a sense of optimism. Um, whenever this exhibit was originally happening, I was just wondering if you still see that optimism today, given some fraught um, situations between indigenous and non-indigenous parties? I'll take the first part. Um, the idea seems to be with some people that fine art is a Western concept and is untranslatable into Aboriginal culture. This is not the case. Uh, all Aboriginal languages have a word that refers to uh, intelligent design, if you don't want to call it that way. Kuruwari in her language and uh, Walka in the Western Desert, and so on. And these these are meaningful marks, and they're the, the words for the paintings and the design elements of the paintings. They're also the words that, that refer to the patent nature of spider webs, uh, the dappled dottedness of clear water, and so on and so on. So there is a, there is a, a notion of the special marks that are beyond the mundane. Now that's fine art in anyone's kind of language, if you, unless you want to get picky. Um, so that, at least that covers the marks or the art. Um, and as to the fineness, uh, Aboriginal people have their own aesthetic system, or systems plural. And we we had a whole chapter or a whole section of the Dreaming's approach, which, which was devoted to exploring an aesthetic which was not a Western one, but was still an aesthetic, one based on energy, power, and danger um, rather than on idealized beauty and we try we have written about that in the, in the book I won't go on about it but there was also a, a free handout 
one of two that the Asian Society gave to visitors to the exhibition. One was called Dreamings, which was focused on that aspect, the narrative mythological aspect. And, and to illustrate each point, there was an image from the exhibition next to the text. <clears throat> and I've lost my copy of that, but I did keep the, the other one, which was called Aesthetics. And it's with Margot Smith now, I've given it to her. And in there, you will find a painting by a friend here, Balan uh, Moenjo, uh, a Namargon, a lightning figure. And in just in the little bit of text, I try to make the point that unless you can read this <clears throat> from within the system of the artist, you might find it a beautiful picture in your own eyes, but you may not notice that those uh, stripes running from his head to his buttocks are lightning flashes. Lightning is dangerous. It comes with the wet. The wet brings life. It also brings power, danger, and, uh, and so on. There's a lot of mythology about the monsoon weather as interpreted in people's cultural terms. So um, I don't think that it's really a choice between you know, fine art and, and understanding the culture. Um, I mean, do, do people really think they understand Italian 14th century painting uh, when they have no knowledge of Italian patronage history, um, the symbolism of, of the iconic nature of all these different elements, like what's that banana, or not banana, what's that uh, apple doing on the table? Um, <laughs> if you say, oh, I don't need that, I, look, I just, I'm just interested in the look of it, well, okay, that's fine, you do that. Um, you're probably a barbarian, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, I was gonna just, before Chris picks up the second part of your question, I think it is something that that needs to be a part of the legacy of this symposium and the discussions around this exhibition. The, the hubris, I think, of assuming that Aboriginal artists slot into fine art, or Indigenous artists anywhere, um, is something that has been, you know, Dreamings was working against that. Dreamings was saying, fine art sits within a tradition of creative practice that's been going on for many thousands of years. It has a language, if you bother to learn it. It has uh, a sophisticated, uh, art history that just encompasses so much more than you are attributing to it if you just slot uh, these paintings into a Euro-American tradition of fine art. I think, um, you know, what you find, and it's not what any of us intended, none of us started working in this terrain. You end up by being an anthropologist working with artists in other ways to be the, the default art historian of a tradition because you're interested in um, the historic, aesthetic, spiritual, political, uh, and personal aspects of a tradition, you effectively become a really, what a good art historian does for a Renaissance painter. You're just offering that same respect to other kinds of artists. And I think um, people like Terry, Ian McLean, the great thinkers in, in art history and art theory around Australian art have, have all acknowledged this, you know. There isn't a separation between anthropology, ethnography, and art history. It's just that the artists are demanding a far more comprehensive <laughs> intellectual discipline than just an anthropologist or just an art historian could ever provide. There's actually a genre of scholarship required in Australia and in the world now that is still emergent. It's still inadequate to the task of what these artists have set us. I would all also add that there are, in my view, certain human universals in noticing forms and patterns and shapes and colours. Every human being can distinguish bright from dull. Every human being can notice symmetry. It stands out, in, in not in all Aboriginal images, but in a great many of them, that they're symmetrical. Um, so we can all share, even if we have total ignorance of, the, of, of other people's culture, we can notice their symmetries. And symmetries are deeply embedded in Aboriginal tradition. The, uh, the, uh, it's, it's called by anthropologists reciprocity. Uh, they're deeply committed to binarisms. Uh, we've heard about the moieties from John yesterday. There are many other binarisms deeply embedded in the culture. And uh, that's about um, fair exchange, equality of exchange between, for, for example, your agnates and your affines, and that's anthropological jargon for your, your own blood family versus your in-laws. Um, and if those relationships are out of kilter, out of balance, and asymmetrical, 
then there is trouble and there is conflict. So there's a, there is a, there's a sort of social ethic in the symmetry which is to do with the happiness of conjoint relationships. Terry, I know you, let me just answer that second question and we should come to you because you're, I can tell you're raring to go. Um, yeah, look, I mean, I think 30 years later, if you look at Aboriginal Australia, there's still optimism, but there's still pessimism as well. I mean, you know, for many years, Australian culture, Aboriginal culture was suppressed where, you know, kids were punished for speaking <coughs> their own language. And, and the extraordinary thing uh, about the Aboriginal art movement now is that people are making a living, somewhat of a living, from something that comes out of themselves, not, not the imperialistic in, introduced culture. And that's an optimistic thing, and it still goes on. But, you know, it's up and down. I mean, we just saw the other day in Yaluk, the, uh, Arnhem, one of the Arnhem Land art centers that was really leading edge and doing really well and so on, uh, has gone into receivership you know, owing hundreds of thousands of dollars. And yet they were selling, on behalf of the artists right there in the communities, uh, you know, a couple hundred grand worth of art every year. And, and so there's both good and bad. You know, it's, I, I think on the, on the whole, it's kind of better than it was before, so I'm still optimistic. But, you know, uh, Aboriginal people in many communities are some of the poorest people in the world, and that's still not a good thing. Yeah, I was wondering if you'd mention the English school teacher who went to Papunya in 73 and um, with his own money bought paints for the, the kids. And then the older guys just kind of came around and took the paints and started painting all over the place. Um, yeah, I think the, the question is about Geoffrey Barden, who was um, the, the school teacher at Papunya in the, the early 1970s, who um, it's, it's a... It's a good question. In some ways, you know, there are mythologies that surround the origins of every art movement. And one of the mythologies in Australia is that Aboriginal art started in 1971 when a, a school teacher encouraged uh, a bunch of the world's greatest unknown artists to start painting. Um, so it's a really extraordinary story, uh, what happened at Papunya in the 1970s. And I won't go into it in great depth today because I think there's more, there's more to be um, extracted from these guys than that story. But uh, what you get when you look at Dreamings, the collections that were shown, the towers, those small sculptures that Peter was talking about in the case, in the photo uh, that Eleanor also showed, that was a commission. That was a, a sculptural commission created by a missionary, admittedly, 110 years ago uh, by the Dieri, from the Dieri people. There was, th that's, that's another tradition that sits in the context of dreaming. So the, it wasn't just the, the origin myth of 1971. There was the work in, in Arnhem Land and the incredible artistic trajectories of someone like Yirrawala in the mid-20th century. There are three of his paintings in dreamings. One of the great painters, probably of the 20th century. You know, Picasso was a fan. He misunderstood his work, but he was a fan because he was operating from that... Uh, that hubristic position that all art references Western art. Um, but there are many beginnings, and Dreamings is just another beginning. It's another part of a story that's been going on for 60 odd thousand years. Um, so I think it, we don't want to over, over emphasize 1971, even though it was catalytic, it was an extremely important part in this longer art histor historical tradition. So um, this is wonderful to hear these stories and actually see those images. It's, um, Henry made a, a very important point about a, a difference in the discursive framework between 1988 and now. And one of them is that, as you said, curating has become a kind of discipline. Um, that's to say, art curating has become aware of itself as a disciplinary practice that is in some ways parallel to uh, criticism, to art making, um, and indeed to anthropology and so on. What struck me this morning, very vividly for the first time, when I was, I think we flashed very quickly past one of Peter's diagrams of how the show might, how people might walk through the show. And we were lucky to hear from your, from your talk, see these wonderful images of 
the beginning of the exhibition with the Napoli spirit dreaming, and then the first room, by the look of it, we could conjure the first room. My question is going to be particularly about the time of the exhibition, the temporalities within the exhibition, what it was like to move through those spaces, particularly in New York, but also elsewhere, in terms of your vision of what would be the time of the experience of the exhibition, the learning process that you had in mind, and how that related to, as it were, this is maybe too complex, the times, the temporalities in the works. Because that's the kind of, you know, to me, and I think to many people, it's the essence of an exhibition of this kind. Could you just speak to a bit of that, and we'll probably talk about it more as we go along. That's a super question, by the way. <laughs> There were, in the exhibition, a number of anonymous works, in other words, the creators' names had never been recorded, dating from the 1880s and earlier, 1840s. Um, a, a, a Gower and a Shield. Uh, there were bark paintings from the uh, Alligator Rivers region, which had been simply stolen off the beach in the 1880s. We, got, we borrowed them from the Maclay Museum in Sydney. Um, so, in a sense, there was a, a early, early collecting temporality um, and uh, this is from memory so don't quote me on this but I think they were pretty early in the show yeah. and then bark paintings were kind of next and the acrylics were the crescendo um, in all sorts of ways. Uh, we had some barks that were very long and big uh, especially the Baldwin Spencer ones from Owen Pelly 1916, 1914 um, and there again they were commissioned. Uh, there's a lot of commission out there. Um, but then, the, in a sense, the bark paintings were of materials and substances and designs that were probably extremely old. We had, do have photographs, Howard Morphy's published one, of pe people painting in bar on bark in their wet season shelters um, in bush camps. So th that was not a new practice. Um, the transition to, actually in the first case, it was not to Belgian linen, it was to plywood and, and masonite. Uh, the early Papania works are not on canvas. Um, they are on objet trouvé sometimes. And they we said, had the two by four uh, uh, wood uh, that was painted as well. Yes, and in amongst what would look like a bark painting collection, and this is in the catalogue, I don't know if it's in the, might be in the, in the actual show, there's a little uh, swallow and aerial box lid, swallow and aerial made biscuits, and this is the lid of the box and it was uh, it borrowed or nicked by someone who then painted a beautiful image on the back of it. And we, I think we tried to show that in a case so you could see the, the kind of transitional nature of it. And there was a personal note for me. My father's mother was a char lady in that factory at, at that time. <laughs> Actually, um, what people saw first when they come to the Asia Society was the film that Faye filmed uh, back at Yun de Moon before before they would before they would actually enter enter the room, which you know which I think was really significant because they would see you know people who are painting, who are very much alive, who are talking and who are describing, yeah. And it was it, it was images, you know, it was. Alive, so contemporary, so that 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 was also really important. Okay. Okay. Wow, well, ladies and gentlemen, please <clears throat> uh, join me in thanking this extraordinary, distinguished panel. I <laughs> I, I'm sure you'll agree there's an awful lot more to be discussed there, so hopefully you'll all um, come tomorrow morning when we can sort of start the conversation afresh. Um, it's now lunchtime, <clears throat> so you're all uh, encouraged to go and get some lunch. Uh, the best options, uh, there are many options in Newcomb Hall, uh, so if you just come up the stairs, Newcomb Hall is just behind us, uh, and we'll be reconvening at 1 p.m. Uh, with a very, very special guest, um, one of Australia's most important living 
No, I'm going to scratch that. <clears throat> One of the most important artists working in the world today, mm -hmm. uh, Balang John Mongel. Um, so that'll be at one o'clock. Uh, so I'll expect to see you all back then. Thank you.